on the brink of what looks to be a busy week in Washington, we'll talk with two members of Congress. Representatives Debbie Dingell and Paul Mitchell are here to talk the Mueller investigation, the National Emergency Declaration, and much more. And how to grow Detroit's African-American middle class. Today is Sunday, February 24th, 2019, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. I'm glad you're with us. It would appear we have quite a week or two ahead. There seems to be a sense that the long-running Mueller investigation will soon reach its apex with the delivery of its findings to the Attorney General. Likely not this week, but Mueller has gotten guilty pleas or indictments on 34 people and three companies thus far. But will the report stitch together a tale of collusion or obstruction? And how much of a fight will there be over whether or not you and I actually get to see it? We're going to talk about that this morning with two members of Congress, Republican Paul Mitchell and Democrat Debbie Dingell, who, as you know, has been through the agonizing and emotional loss of her husband, the Dean John Dingell. I'm so grateful the Congresswoman was willing to keep her appointment with us because there is a ton to talk about. Is the nation in a state of emergency when it comes to illegal immigration? And was the state of Michigan right to join the fight against that declaration? Also, polls are flying around right now that show Americans of both parties want the rich to pay more in taxes. Is that the right thing to do? If so, by how much? In fact, with the federal debt hitting record levels now at $22 trillion, Somebody's going to have to pay up. We'll talk about that, too. And a little later on, a new report hits on something that city builders and planners can often obsess over, building the American, African-American middle class in Detroit. It's all coming up today on Flashpoint. Well, what kind of week is this going to be? Well, consider, President Trump is traveling to Vietnam to meet with North Korea's Kim Jong-un. While he's there, his former attorney, Michael Cohen, is expected to testify in front of several Capitol Hill committees in what political watchers will see as much CTV. Vice President Mike Pence, meanwhile, will be in Colombia to call for Venezuelan leader Nicolas Maduro to step down. And anywhere in or around those events, Robert Mueller could deliver his investigation report to Attorney General William Parr. Let's talk about it this morning with the Republican Congressman from Michigan's 10th District, Paul Mitchell, and uh, the Democrat representing Michigan's 12th District, Debbie Dingell. And Congressman, if I could start with you, I know you wanted to spend just a, a quick moment thanking uh, you, you've, you and the family have felt an awful lot of gratitude for what you've uh, the outpouring you've seen. It's been incredible. I, I think John would uh, be very surprised to have seen the outpouring and the number of people that have just been there who stopped the fire and the police who've been just absolutely incredible. I wouldn't have made it without them. The people that came to the viewing, the funeral mass, were very blessed with their friends and I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. And I can hear him in my ear when Paul said, are you still going to do Flashpoint? Deborah, get your out there and don't stay home and cry. So I may not be as intense. Well, I may be intense, but a different way. But <laughs> right, right. his voice is in my ear. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks very much. Uh, Paul, you said something a while ago. I don't know if it's, it was really for the I'll let you decide whether or not you want to repeat it. But you said something about what these last seven weeks have been like for you. How did you describe them? Well, I think the last seven weeks have been the longest seven weeks, uh, roughest seven weeks of my professional life. That's certainly the case. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, wrangling over a subject that I don't think we made any significant improvement in or any gains on, and that's uh, spent that much time doing that. As uh, it, I came from over business. in particular Im immigration or over homeless security and immigration, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it, I believe it's solvable if rational people sat down, closed the door, and got outside of politics. Uh, there's some people on both sides of the aisle that uh, think that they want to use it for political messaging rather than solve the problem and move on to something else that America needs, and that can be pretty exasperating. So, uh, Was the president right to declare, is it an emergency? I think it's a crisis. You look at the data, what's going on, we've, we've got, a, for example, five, over 500 uh, adult men were stopped at the border with minors that weren't their children. There's been almost 300% increase in, in families coming from places like Guatemala, Colombia, and going through that trek. Yeah. Uh, doctors on border say about a third of the women making that trek are sexually assaulted. We have a problem at the border, and it's a real problem. Uh, the bill that passed and ultimately was signed doesn't adequately, it doesn't come close to adequately addressing that, and that's, that's really unfortunate because it's going to continue. But is the emergency declaration helpful? Uh, I think the emergency declaration just adds one more problem to the equation. And Congressman Engel, you were shaking your head no. Okay. 
Well, and I think that Paul agrees with me. It's a constitutional crisis. I mean, the last seven weeks for me have been very complicated. Obviously, the last two horrendous. Oh, yes. But I, I think not only do I don't know any Republican or Democrat that doesn't care about national security and wanting to keep this nation safe. We need. To, there may be a disagreement about how we get there. I, you, you know, don't. I don't think compromise is a dirty word. I don't think the wall. You know, the places it doesn't even make sense along that border with the water. But we also forget that. Public employees didn't work for five weeks. I mean, we had the TSA, Custom and Border Patrol, FBI, uh, Coast Guard, Secret Service, all deemed essential. And these were people that were hurting. I mean, TSA couldn't afford to drive to work. I had an employee from Belleville that had to work the midnight shift. What should have, we should have done, in my opinion, let me stop real quick and say that, you know, I talked to you earlier. Uh, John was a legend. No one will. Meet, meet the duration of his service, the service yeah, to our country, yeah. and I just want to repeat that. No one is going to, uh, no one should go two pay periods, four weeks without being paid. As you know, my dad built trucks in the line and mom worked the Salvation Army. I, using people as hostages, either party should is wrong. We, would, how do you feel about these bills that have been introduced to remove that as an option, a shutdown I as a weapon? I have a bill with Roger Christian Morthy, mm -hmm. a Democrat from uh, Chicago, yep. an Obama appointee, by the way, that would ex do exactly that. And eliminated all the political talking points, just said this is wrong. In my opinion, last week, we should have passed the six bills that weren't related to Homeland Security and done a continuing resolution for the other two and wrangled about what secures our border rather than just pass and, seven yeah. and make it continue a political football. Uh, but I want to move to other topics, but before I do, it was, was Dana Nessel right for Michigan to join the lawsuit against the... I, I think we have a constitutional crisis right now. I think the Constitution is very clear in three branches of government and the system of checks and balances. And it, the Emergency uh, Powers Act does not authorize the president to do what he did. But I think that you'll find that Paul agrees with me on that. Uh, how are you going to vote when this comes well, think, next week? I think Dana, uh, in answer to your question, I think Dana was, uh, the state doesn't have at this point in time standing. You can't have speculative risk or speculative damage. You have to say this is the problem that's caused. I think it's another example of just partisan climbing on rather than solving a problem. I, I have to agree that I think the emergency declaration, the way it's being handled, con troubles me a great deal. Uh, Article 1 says that the spending bills start in the House of Representatives. Right. Uh, I don't believe the National Emergency Act uh, simply allows you to move money around if you determine this emergency. It sets a really bad precedent. So next week is a, is a really tough set of votes. My guess is going to be a very ugly scene, as you noted, in, uh, yeah. in D.C. next week for a lot of reasons. Let's move to what else might be coming this week, which might be this report. No, I do think it will pass the House and Senate. You, and, the, and I think there will be many more Republicans than people realize. The question is, will there be enough Votes to override to over, a veto. Override a veto. Um, if, if the, when the Mueller uh, report does come out, can you see any reason why I shouldn't be allowed to see it, or most Americans, given the intense interest that it's had over these years? Uh, I, I think it should be made public. I'm very concerned. It's investigating whether Russia interfered with our election process. And I'm somebody who thinks that kind of report, unless there's a national serious national security implication that would endanger our national security that the American people have a right to see it. I've seen some of the intelligence thus far. There is some classified material. So I think they're going to have to go through and redact some of it so we don't, in fact, put out information we don't want out. Otherwise, I think the public should be able to see it because we need to move beyond this, this secrecy, this idea. I saw a Reuters article this, this week about the Mueller investigation. A comment I think is valid is uh, most of the revelations from the Mueller investigation thus far are already public. There have been mm -hmm. people indicted, mm -hmm. most things for things unrelated to a campaign. I've seen nothing so far, and I've been through a fair amount of the, the intelligence information that, uh, that indicates there's collusion. Uh, that doesn't mean Russia hasn't tried to meddle in our elections. Let's make a distinction there, because they have, and they have for a long time. They've got more sophisticated. Why all the lying, then, about whether or not meetings had taken place with, with, with people from the Russian government or connected to the Russian government? Why, well, why lie about if it? If you think I can climb into in Cohen's head, you know, <laughs> <laughs> let's be serious well, about it. That might that's, be a whole, well, other people that's a whole other well, world, they're... Devin. Come on. <laughs> Understood. Um, but to, to your point, then, and I want you both to weigh in on this, um, I'm not sure that we've really had a drill down on exactly what we can do or should do about Russia's uh, influence uh, uh, med and meddling. Uh, there's a, a fair amount of scholarship that's gone on in the UK that shows that not only did they did their mayhem sowing meddle in our election, but it also had something to do with the Brexit vote uh, that took place there. And we've got another big election coming up in pretty short order here, and I don't get the sense that anything is happening to change uh, that influence. 
Well, I, I think that, I, I will say that I think people are working very hard, that people have been warned, Secretary of State's across the country, mm -hmm. uh, about the potential of interfering with the voting, uh, the actual voting process in that, uh, the, the security of all of the voting mm -hmm. process. I mean, I think we've got to worry about some things domestically, too, in terms of registering vote and whether people are, uh, we, we're going to have some very clear, tough votes in, in the Congress about uh, the voting, voting rights of period people. But um, I, I am worried about, I think Russia will try to interfere the how you control or how you Control is not the right word, but the social media That's, impact it. Well, I was going to say that. And the, how you are able to even, a, able to uh, uh, impact what they're doing. I was going to say, securing the voting process sounds relatively easy compared to what do we do about all of the planted stories and social media may have. The good news about our voting process is it's decentralized. That is, in fact, mm -hmm. meddling in it is a state by state or even t area by area deal. You, they're, they're all, and all connected. Yeah. So the reality is, it's much harder to do. What happens in terms of the impact of foreign entities, and China has been involved in some too, is uh, <coughs> never mind North Korea, is is meddling in the social media component of fu uh, of literally fake news, yeah. uh, you know, in the truest sense of the word, and, and that is something that all we can do is expect that they look at that. They look carefully at announce and look at that. I, I, I got to get to a lot more. In fact, you just mentioned North Korea. We'll talk about that when we continue. <laughs> this is Flashpoint on Local 4.